Hello, everyone. Welcome back uh, to the last plenary session of, of the day. I am uh, Selen Atasoy. I am a neuroscientist at the University of Oxford. And it's my pleasure to chair this very exciting uh, plenary session on psychoactive substances. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, who is uh, an expert in the neurobiology of psychedelics, Catherine Preller from the University of Zurich and jointly based also at the University of Yale. Please help me welcome Catherine. Thank you so much for the nice introduction and thank you very much for inviting me to present our work on psychedelics here. So my talk is going to be about the neuro, uh, neurobiology and neuropsychopharmacology of psychedelic induced altered states of consciousness. And I'm going to talk mainly about two substances. One is psilocybin, the major active compound of the so-called magic mushrooms. And the other one is LSD. Um, they induce quite a similar altered state of consciousness. However, and this will become important within the talk, they have a different pharmacology. So um, psilocybin targets mainly serotonin, serotonergic receptors, importantly the serotonin 1A and 1-2, uh, sorry, 2A and 1A <coughs> receptors. Um, LSD, on the other hand, has a more diverse pharmacology. So, additional to serotonergic receptors, it also targets the dopamine system. So, being the first speaker in this um, session, I kind of wanted to give you a quick introduction about the history of research on psychedelics. Um, as you probably know, LSD has been synthesized not too far from here in Basel in Switzerland in 1938. It took another five years until the psychoactive effects of LSD were actually discovered by accident um, by Albert Hoffman. So um, that basically had, a big, had big implications for the development of psychopharmacology in general because back at that time, in 1943, it wasn't even known that serotonin was actually in the brain. We knew that it was in the gut, but we didn't have a clue that it was also in the brain. So that wasn't discovered until 10 years later. And when people realized that, and when they realized the similarity between LSD and serotonin, that really catalyzed the development of, um, of uh, psychoactive compounds that are now used for the treatment of psychiatric disorders. Um, but back to the story of LSD itself. Um, LSD was then pretty early on used as um, an adjunct to treatment in psychiatric diseases. Um, and we even had clinics using LSD uh, in therapy. But I guess you're all aware of the rest of the story. So LSD appeared on the streets. Um, it was associated with the uh, counterculture movement. There was a lot of misinformation happening as well. So I'm not a medical doctor. I'm still pretty sure that this is highly unlikely. Um, it was placed in Schedule 1 in the US first and then all over the world, basically. Um, and what happened then is that we had a lot of research during the 50s and 60s with psychedelic compounds. But of course, after it was placed in Schedule 1, people didn't necessarily lose interest. And it was also not forbidden, as many people think, to do research with these compounds. But it just got much more difficult. And especially, there was just no funding available for doing this type of research. And now, um, since the early 1990s, um, and especially in the last 10 years, there has been a revival of this type of research. It doesn't necessarily show up in this um, figure here, um, but what you can see here is that research on this, these compounds never really stopped. But what changed within the last 10 to 20 years is that um, all of this research here is mainly uh, done in animals. And what happened recently is we have now the first experimental and clinical trials, again, with these substances in humans. 
So back to the effects of psilocybin and LSD. As I said, the subjective effects of these two compounds are pretty similar. However, there is a major difference, and the major difference is the duration of action. So as you can see here, psilocybin effects last for about uh, five to six hours after administration. However, things become a lot more complicated after the administration of LSD. Um, well, not necessarily complicated, but very long. So the effects of LSD last up to 10 hours at the doses we usually administer, can be even longer, up to 24 hours, which obviously makes the research more complicated for our participants as well as for our investigators, because, of course, we, um, our participants are medically supervised and psychologically supervised during all these times. So another thing that I think is interesting about these compounds is their harm potential. And um, what you can see here is that LSD as well as magic mushrooms are considered to be on the rather safe side of all the drugs, illegal as well as, um, as medically prescribed um, psychoactive substances. So the reason for this is usually that, well, first of all, they don't have any addictive potential, which is important. The other thing is that even if you take pretty heroic doses of these substances, it probably won't be pleasant, but it's really hard to kill yourself with these substances, which is different from, for example, alcohol or heroin. Um, but that, on the other hand, doesn't mean that you know, they are just completely safe. Um, so, for example, for people with cardiac problems, um, that might be an issue. Also, people who have predisposition for psychotic diseases. Um, and, of course, a big issue is uncontrolled environments. So, you, in an uncontrolled environment, you cannot help someone or you cannot control that they don't do anything stupid like driving a car, for example. But within the medical context and the research we are doing, we are, we are very confident that we can administer these substances very safely. So coming back to the subjective effects of these substances, um, well, one of the reasons why they are also called hallucinogens is because they induce visual alterations. And to give you an impression of what that might look like for the participants in our studies is, um, if you look at this picture of a wolf, what might happen under the influence of psilocybin or LSD is that um, colors might start to appear brighter, colors might change more or less completely, things might start to get a little bit blurry, and what happens very often is that things just start moving. So we're not necessarily talking about hallucinations here, we're more talking about illusions, at least at the doses we administer. However, these substances do much more than just um, induce visual alterations. So these are some of the questionnaires. This is LSD, this is psilocybin. Um, and here you can hopefully see um, they are inducing a lot of different things which we then call an altered state of consciousness. So it's not just visual alterations, which is basically what you see here, but it's also alterations in self-perception and um, also here and um, alterations in, um, well, insightfulness, and um, they can create a state of unity or a bliss blissful state as well. So, and these are really the things that we are interested in. And um, as you probably have heard of, and as um, Matthew Johnson will tell you in the next talk, there are currently quite a few clinical trials going on that show that these substances um, might have some beneficial effects in various psychiatric disorders. Um, but that's not necessarily what I'm going to talk about today. But the questions that I want to answer I go back to what I've told you before, that psychedelics induce this altered state of consciousness. They induce very unique effects that are otherwise really hard to study. So we use these substances as tools to investigate phenomena that might also be clinically relevant. And we think that increasing the mechanistic and neurobiological neurobiolo understanding of these substances also is important to eventually uncover the full clinical potential. 
So the question I'm trying to answer today is, what is the pharmacology and the neurobiology of psychedelics? And um, before I start answering this question, this is my last slide before I dive into the results, is um, a bit of a background on the pharmacology of LSD because it's important to understand the results then. So the pharmacology of LSD, as I've said before, is a little bit more complex than the pharmacology of uh, psilocybin, uh, meaning that it targets the serotonin 2A receptor just as other serotonergic uh, psychedelics, as well as dopamine receptors. And before we did that study that I'm going to present in a minute, um, it has been shown from the animal literature that the serotonin 2A receptor as well as the dopamine receptor might be important for the effects of LSD. However, we didn't know that in humans. So we wanted to investigate um, the specific contribution of the serotonin 2A receptor. And to be able to do that, we used a second substance which is called catanserin. And catanserin is a rather specific serotonin 2A receptor antagonist. So what that means is it blocks the serotonin 2A receptor and LSD, when we administer LSD afterwards, LSD can't reach this receptor anymore. It will stimulate all the other receptors, but not the serotonin 2A receptor. So the idea is if we block this one, we just see which types of effects are left. Um, and these are the first results that I wanted to present you. So this is the questionnaire, basically the same thing that you've seen before. And the first thing that you will notice are these high pink bars. Um, they're actually not that interesting, to be honest, because they just show that LSD is, is doing what LSD is supposed to do. Um, it induces an altered state of consciousness with um, basically every symptom increased except for anxiety, which is good because we try to prepare our participants as well as possible. And the other thing that was increased but not necessarily um, statistically significant is the spiritual experience. Well, um, I'm really sure that Matthew Johnson will talk a lot more about spiritual experiences. Um, here you might imagine that taking LSD and then li lying in a, in a brain scanner for um, more than two hours might just not be the most spiritual experience ever. Um, the interesting part really on this slide is actually what you can't really see. So it's the, the green bars and the yellow bars down here. So the green bars are placebo. Again, placebo is doing what placebo is supposed to do, basically nothing. Um, but the yellow bars are interesting. So this is the condition where we administered catanserin first. And as you can see, um, the symptoms induced by LSD are reduced completely to a um, placebo level. So participants weren't able to distinguish whether they had gotten uh, a placebo or whether they had gotten catanserin and LSD afterwards. So it seems like the sub subjective effects of LSD um, administered at the dose we did, which was, which was 100 microgram, seem to be fully dependent on the serotonin 2A receptor. So if LSD doesn't stimulate this receptor, then we don't get any um, subjective effects. We also did a rating over time because the animal literature had suggested that there might be two different phases. One is more serotonergic, one is more dopaminergic. But as you can see here, we don't get any effect over time either when we administer catanserin first. So now we're going into the brain imaging data. So what you can see here is basically your brain on LSD. Um, and I walk you through this rather busy slide. So what we see on top here is um, functional connectivity, alterations and functional connectivity induced by LSD. And what you see here are, well, warm colors and co uh, cold colors. The warm colors um, say that there is an increased connectivity from this area to the rest of the brain, whereas the cool colors show you that there's decreased connectivity, decreased communication between these areas and the rest of the brain. And for the people who are used to look at these types of images, you immediately will see that there is a differentiation between two major networks. So um, the, the warm colors here 
they are, so the increased connectivity is in areas which are responsible for our sensory perception. So we have the occipital cortex, um, we have the motor cortex and the sensory cortex and the auditory cortex. So it seems like our um, sensory areas, the, the areas which are processing the sensory information that we get from within our body as well as from our environment, they are highly connected with each other. On the other hand, we see these blue areas and these blue areas, they are responsible for integrating this sensory information. And I think um, intuitively that, that makes a lot of sense because um, LSD and other psychedelics are inducing a, an altered state of, uh, of consciousness which is very sensory, right? But the way we integrate the sensory information just is very different, which then probably accounts for things like um, hallucinations or even things like, well, if I integrate this information differently, I might also see the world differently and I might see myself differently. So this might be what is underlying the psychedelic state, a higher connectivity of sensory regions together with a disintegration of how we process this information and how we bring this information together. Um, there's another interesting part about the slide, which is uh, down here. So it's basically these graphs here. So again, the pink bars are LSD, um, green and yellow are placebo and catanserin plus LSD. And what you can see from this slide in particular is that, um, again, catanserin plus LSD reduces all these alterations that LSD is inducing back to placebo level. And I didn't bring you a slide where I compared catanserin plus LSD with placebo because there's nothing on it. It's just a gray brain. So there's no difference in connectivity changes between the placebo and the catanserin plus LSD condition. So it seems like also these neural effects of LSD are dependent on the serotonin 2A receptor. So um, since we weren't quite sure whether you know, this is really the case and scientists always want confirmation over confirmation for their hypothesis, so we used a different method to again see whether um, uh, we can see that it's really the serotonin to a receptor. And what we did here is we used samples from um, a library which is called the Allen Human Brain Atlas. And they have receptor expression data on um, many, many receptors um, in post-mortem brains. Um, so that allowed us to create a map and see where the serotonin to a receptors are located in the brain. And what we did then is we compared this map that we got to see where the serotonin 2A receptors are, compared this with our functional connectivity data, and we saw and compared that with basically all the receptors that LSD is targeting. And again, we see a really high correlation um, between our functional connectivity data and the serotonin 2A receptor. And um, then obviously we wanted to see, well, does these do these changes in functional connectivity kind of relate to what people are experiencing? And what we saw here is that in particular, the somatomotor network is highly correlated with what people tell us they are experiencing at that point in time. And I think that is particularly interesting because the somatomotor network has been implicated in like a sense of presence and the sense of self as well. And in case you were wondering, because I've been talking a lot about LSD now, in case you were wondering, well, does that hold true for psilocybin as well? Well, yes, it does. So what you can see here is psilocybin data, um, more or less similar analysis, and we see exactly the same effects also under the influence of psilocybin, which kind of gives us confidence that this is a true feature of the psychedelic state. Um, the next analysis we did is, well, we wanted to look at how do these effects evolve because um, it takes about an hour from administration to peak effects. And what we see here is um, the first scan conducted 20 minutes, 25 minutes after administration, 40 minutes after administration, 70 minutes after administration. And what you can see here real nicely is how these effects develop. So, we started alterations in the occipital cortex, which is kind of in line what our participants tell us. So the first thing they usually notice is, for example, the floor moving a little bit. Um, and then the effects get stronger and stronger until we reach the peak effects here. 
Um, another thing that we were interested in was, well, is there a way of how to predict these changes? Because um, as Matt will be talking about the clinical effects, it would be really nice if we had some kind of indication um, who will respond um, and how will the people respond to the substance. And again, I'm not trying to steal your thunder here, but I'm pretty sure that um, Matt will talk about that the strengths of the effects are somewhat related to um, the clinical response. And what we've seen here is that indeed, if we scan people under placebo, so at a baseline basically, um, this base, the way their brain is organized in a, at baseline is predictive of the strength of the effects that we see after the administration of psilocybin. So um, this might mean, and obviously this has to be replicated in a clinical context, that um, we could predict from the baseline activity and connectivity um, the strength of what people might be experiencing afterwards. And again, here we see that this correlation develops over time and is strongest at peak effects. So um, there is another theory um, which is supposed to explain how psychedelics work in the brain. And um, this theory was published by Mark Geyer and Franz Vollenweider. Um, both theories are, of course, not mutually exclusive. Um, what this theory says is that um, there's a structure in the brain which is called the thalamus. And the thalamus usually works in a way that it filters information from our environment. Um, and it filters it in a way that some information can reach the cortex and therefore conscious awareness, probably, um, and some information can't. And what Mark Gay and Franz Vollenweider suggested is by stimulating um, the seroton serotonin neurons or serotonin receptors in the brain, um, another structure in the brain, which is called the ventral striatum, will lose its power, its controlling power over the thalamus, and therefore the thalamus just won't work as well as it usually does, and will lose its ability to filter information and therefore it will just let information flow to the cortex. Um, and we were able to test this prediction empirically with a method that is called spectral DCM. So this method, unfortunately, right now at least, does not um, allow us to look at the whole brain. So we had to restrict ourselves to four interesting brain regions. The ventral striatum, I've already mentioned, and the thalamus, of course, and two cortical regions, which we know are implicated in the effects of psychedelics. And these are basically the results we got. And what you can see here is, first of all, the ventral striatum indeed has decreased connectivity to the thalamus. And um, so the blue arrows are decreased connectivity. Um, the other thing that we saw is, indeed, the thalamus does send more information to the posterior cingulate cortex, a region that is part of the default mode network and has been implicated in self-processing. Um, however, and here's the caveat, we've also seen that the thalamus sends less information to the temporal cortex, another cortical region. Um, and so this basically means that, yes, um, most of this uh, model probably is very correct. So indeed, um, decreased, uh, decreased control over the thalamus um, and different information flow from the thalamus to the cortex. But it doesn't seem to be like the uh, thalamus is just letting information to the co uh, cortex um, everywhere, but it seems like it's rather controlled. It seems to be sending information to particular areas of the cortex. Um, and I think, again, this intuitively makes a lot of sense because the psychedelic state is not necessarily chaotic, um, which probably would be the case if there was just information going everywhere. So um, I'm going to wrap these results up. Uh, so we have seen that LSD-induced subjective as well as neuro neural effects are dependent on the serotonin 2A receptor. We've seen that LSD, as well as psilocybin, induce this in increased uh, integration in sensory areas and at the same time decrease um, the functional connectivity or the integration in these associative regions which are responsible to make a coherent sense of the information we receive. Um, 
we've also seen that it seems like the Sumatra motor network might be closely associated with the subjective effects. We've seen that baseline connectivity measures might be predictive of the magnitude of psilocybin-induced effects. And we've seen that alterations in directed or effective connectivity in LSD-induced states um, seem to be at least partially in line with the Stadamic filter model. So again, um, I think understanding how psychedelics work increases our understanding of altered states of consciousness. And we hope that by increasing the mechanistic and your bio biological understanding of these substances, it will really help to uncover their full clinical potential. So um, thank you very much for your attention. And of course, um, I have to thank all the people at University of Zurich as well as worldwide who have been involved in this research. Thank you, Catherine, for this uh, fascinating talk and uh, the insights into the neurobiology of the psychedelics. Now, from the neural correlates, we are actually moving to their clinical use and the role of mystical experiences. So for that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Matthew Johnson from Johns Hopkins University as our second speaker. Please welcome Matthew. Thanks, Lynn. Great, our slides are up. Thanks for coming. So, you know, in, in psychedelic research, you know, this is kind of a little bit of a controversial area. It's not your typical research topic. So sometimes we feel like we have to be really serious to convince people this is real science, you know. I mean, sometimes I, I bet the consciousness field in general might, might feel the same way. So I figured I'd start off with just a couple of jokes just to loosen us up cognitively. Okay, so here goes one. A guy has eaten a bunch of psilocybin mushrooms. Okay. He's having a difficult time. He enters a dentist's office, you know, a tooth doctor. He says, Doc, you got to help me out. I'm going crazy. I've turned into a moth. And the dentist said, you know, I'm it. Buddy, I'm a dentist. You need a psychiatrist. Why in the world have you come here? And the guy says, well, because your light was on. Because he's a moth. Light, moth light. OK, OK. All right, here's a better one. So this one I'm taking from, to, from Tim Leary. Oh, thank you. I'll try to do a little better. This, this one is from. Oh, OK. I'll try to be, I'll try to be a little clearer. And uh, I'll, I'll just assume my humor isn't good, though. You, could, you know, uh, but it helps me to you know, just blame it on the accent. <laughs> it makes me feel better. So this one's from Tim Leary. LSD is such a powerful drug. In fact, it is, its power on the mind is so intense that it has the ability to cause psycho a psychotic reaction in people who have never taken it. <laughs> and I think I saw a little bit of that in the question period after Franz's talk yesterday. But, um, and, and OK, final one. I said, I said a couple, but I'll give you three. Um, what did the psychedelic therapy patient say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. Prize over here. Hey, I stole that. That's really about the, what did the Buddhists say to the, but you know, it works. I made it fit. So with that out of the way, and after probably a few of you have uh, left the room, uh, I'll get into my talk by first thanking a really huge number of individuals that have contributed to the work that I'll briefly show you, I, I can't name them all, but some of the key ones, Roland Griffiths, Mary Casamano, Al Garcia, Fred Barrett, um, critical funding organizations, the Hefter Research Institute, uh, the Beckley Foundation, Council on Spiritual Practices, among others. If you want to check out more about our work at Johns Hopkins on psychedelics, I'll refer you to our um, recently developed website, Hopkins Psychedelic 
org. Okay, so psilocybin is the psychoactive uh, agent. I hate when people say ingredient as if there was a cook involved, but it's a psychoactive agent in over a hundred species of mushrooms. And these are amongst the so-called classic psychedelics. So these are the serotonin 2A agonists, um, what Katrin talked about. So not only including psilocybin, but LSD, but also mescaline, which is in peyote and some other cacti, and dimethyltryptamine, which is in ayahuasca. Other drugs that are sometimes called uh, psychedelics, like MDMA or ketamine or, or salvinorin A, um, are not classic psychedelics, and they work through fundamentally different mechanisms, even if there may be some downstream overlap. But they're substantially different enough that you know, classic psychedelics you know, is just referring to these types of compounds. Okay, really hard class of drugs to define, but one of the best de definitions I've come across is from Lester Grinspoon, and it goes like this. A drug which, without causing physical addiction, craving, major physiological disturbances, delirium, disorientation, or amnesia, more or less reliably produces thought, mood, and perceptual changes otherwise rarely experienced except in dreams, contemplative and religious exaltation, flashes of vivid involuntary memory, and acute psychosis. The use of these compounds, and, and psilocybin in particular, is not just historical, but prehistorical. So um, in the middle and on the left, you have some evidence from Meso and South America depicting uh, the sacramental use of psilocybin mushrooms dating back hundreds to over a thousand years ago. On the right uh, is a cave painting from Northern Africa dated back to around 10,000 years ago. So this is about 5,000 years before the first human civilizations in Mesopotamia. So absolutely ancient. And I, there's you know, some debate, but I think, it's, I think it's more likely than not that what's being depicted are sort of mushroomed little men, maybe a shamanistic experience. They're kind of in some sort of ecstatic or at least you know, altered state of some sort. Okay, jumping forward several thousand years, uh, from the 1940s through the 70s, psychedelics were intensely investigated as research tools and therapeutics, and Katrin explained this history well, and of course the really special role that Switzerland has played as the, as the motherland of LSD, thanks to Albert Hoffman. And it wasn't too long after that, that the, the discovery of LSD uh, that it was these drugs were primarily LSD, were used both as neuroscience tools and also as they were explored as therapeutics. And eventually some promising therapeutic findings were noted for two primary indications. Cancer-related distress, so these are people who have some substantial anxiety or depression because they're going to die soon. And then addiction in the form of alcoholism. There was also um, one promising study using LSD to treat heroin addiction, which looked good as well. But then we had the dark ages. So, um, as Katrin mentioned, there were, uh, there were some decades where um, not all psychedelic research stopped. Some really critical things were learned in non-human research during that time, but certainly the human research became virtually dormant. And it's really important to note that it wasn't really because we found that these drugs were just too dangerous to work with when you had the right safeguards in place, and it wasn't that there wasn't any medical promise. It was really um, a reaction to the, to, the, to the street use of psychedelics and their association with the 60s counterculture and all of the changes in society that were happening at that time. So to be clear, there are risks and harms that can come from the use of any of these psychedelic compounds. I recently uh, wrote with colleagues a review paper in neuropharmacology, um, a review of these, and just very briefly, um, psilocybin, and, and th these are going to largely be true of the other classic psychedelics, but it can cause harm in people with, with psychosis, so these are disorders like schizophrenia, or a predisposition for those types of disorders. For anyone, any healthy uh, individual, 
uh, these drugs, especially at a high dose, can cause fear, panic, confusion, and so we call this typically the bad trip or the bum trip back in the day. And even though it is rare, and I don't want to overstate it, um, it's not typical, but it does happen where this, can, this type of panic can sometimes lead to dangerous behavior, so you know, a dangerous accident. And psilocybin in particular, um, we published, uh, we've published with this and so have uh, numerous other laboratories. It causes elevations in pulse and blood pressure. So it's not uh, a severe risk factor, but we don't include people in our research who are at, at, at very severe levels of cardiovascular risk. Because those are the type of individuals you know, who, for whom maybe even going up the stairs um, may be too much exercise for them. And then we've, we've published that psilocybin, in particular, um, systematically in a dose-dependent fashion causes headaches in the day following its use. Typically not severe and nothing that we would anticipate ever preventing its clinical use, but nonetheless, one of the risks to be aware of. Importantly, um, as Katrin mentioned, one of the um, key risks that's associated with most drugs of abuse is not present for the classic psychedelics, and that is they're not drugs of addiction. And we know that at every possible level, the basic neuroscience in terms of the effects in the mesolimbic reward system, the epidemiology or large-scale surveys, um, reliable operant models of, of non-humans responding for drug reward, um, it, it, these do not look like classic reinforcers or addictive substances. Now, that's addiction, meaning compulsive drug use. They can certainly be used, be abused, um, and by that I mean used in a way that's dangerous to the self and others. So a very obvious example is, as Katrin mentioned, driving on a substance like psilocybin, or using in a way that somehow interferes with, with your life functioning. So safety is very important. Over a decade ago, uh, I, with colleagues, published a, a recommended safety guidelines, you're reviewing these risks and basically how you address these. And, and fortunately, you can squarely mitigate these risks. We can reliably screen out people that have a psychosis predisposition. Um, you can prepare people, monitor them, keep them in a safe environment, only have them interact with people who they've developed a rapport with, and that goes a long ways in minimizing the chances, you know, the, any anxious reaction, and you'll still have some anxiety, but then it's in a safe physical environment where that doesn't translate into dangerous behavior. And then follow-up care is important to assess adverse events and to help someone talk through the potentially intense experience they may have had. Because yes, yeah, sometimes you can get this. These are our little friends having a little trouble in their experience. And our friend SpongeBob is showing us his version of the bad trip right here as well. Um, we have developed, I'll tell you later about mystical experience, but to get the, the bad stuff out of the way, because it's there, um, we've developed what we call the challenging experience questionnaire. So this is essentially an assessment of the bad trip, but in, our, in, the, in this clinical research where you've squarely mitigated the risks, we consider them more challenging experiences. In fact, people often report some of these very difficult experiences can be incredible learning experiences. And the same can be said of psychotherapy or life experience in general, that the, the difficult stuff is what are, you know, constitutes growing potential, growth potential. But um, we call it the challenging experience questionnaire. We base it on both lab, both lab research and um, surveys of hundreds of psychedelic users who have reported this type of experience. And the, the, the key factors that we found um, that constituted this type of challenging experience fall into the categories of grief, fear, death, insanity, isolation, physical distress, and paranoia. Sounds like a party. Okay. So part of the formula for minimizing the chances of, of anxiety or panic reactions is, is a pleasing physical environment. This is one of our session rooms. And having that close interpersonal rapport with the folks who are going to be with you, our session guides. And then one of the most powerful things um, to do during a session is simply taking someone's hand. We prepare them for this. Um, I think it's an appropriate use of therapeutic touch, and there should be boundaries surrounding that. But holding someone's hand during an anxious experience um, 
can be a very powerful thing in reassuring them and not leaving them alone. We have two people, so even if one of the guides uses the bathroom for a few minutes, the person is never left alone during the, during the acute effects. So the first couple of studies that our lab published um, were looking at healthy normals, uh, people without a nominal disorder to treat, and it showed that it was safe to administer a, a, a very high dose, um, 30 milligrams body weight adjusted, um, which is most folks would call a so-called heroic dose. Um, we found it was safe in this type of structured setting. And remarkably, and unlike most you know, drug experiences of, for the drugs we study in the lab, like cocaine or tobacco or alcohol, this was rated as among the most the five most meaningful life experiences for the majority of people in the research. And that's just laying on a couch in a hospital in Baltimore. And if you've ever been to Baltimore, that should mean something to you. Or maybe you've seen The Wire, you know. It's not kind of a type of place that by itself induces mystical experiences. And we found that improvements in mood and quality of life were reported by participants over a year after sessions which you typically don't see with drug effects. And then our next follow-up study um, was uh, one where we, we looked at dose effects. So we looked at four different uh, doses of psilocybin and a true placebo. And just the, the remarkable thing that I wanted to show here is that increasing the psilocybin dose has a, an orderly effect on mystical experience, challenging experience, and long-term positive attribution. And what I'm showing you here are the percentage of participants rating the experience amongst the five most spiritually significant events of your life. And so even with this sort of non-traditional measure that you would have in a pharmacology study, we see this beautiful, you know, dose-related effect. So even though there's much more than the, the drug going on, it's very much about the set and setting as well, clearly the drug is having uh, an absolutely critical effect. Okay, so mystical experience. Uh, one of the remarkable things is that in those, those first two studies, about 60% of participants in those studies uh, met criteria for a so-called complete mystical experience. And mystical experience might sound a little woo-woo to some, but the, the, it, it's a concept uh, from the, the psychology of religion, and it is largely nominally divorced from specific um, religious or spiritual beliefs. And uh, this was, I'm showing a picture of William James here. It was, it, this, these types of experiences, experiences were in t of intense interest to him uh, over 100 years ago. I mean, the idea is that it's remarkable that s outside of drug use, similar experiences have been reported across cultures, across the centuries, from different languages, and the, often from a religious perspective, but not always. And the commonalities of these experiences are a sense of unity, like feeling one with the universe, or one with God, one with your fellow human beings, a noetic quality or a self-validating aspect to the experience, sense of sacredness, a sense of stepping outside of the bounds of time and space, an overriding positive uh, mood or quality to the experience, and a sense of ineffability. Um, and here's another, another joke for you. So even though, going back to James, he said these kind of experiences were ineffable. You know, you can't describe them. We keep asking people to describe their experiences, so we keep trying to F it up, even though they're supposed to be ineffable. I hope that didn't offend anyone. Okay, that's going to be it with the jokes. <laughs> so we... Um, We've, look, we've used a number of scales to look at um, mystical uh, type experience, but we, did, we, we developed a scale psychometrically to, um, we validated one based on lab research and, and survey research, and this is the first validated scale to specifically look at mystical experience, specifically from drugs or other uh, acute experiences, which has value things like the, the hood mysticism scale are really were validated to look at experiences across the lifespan rather than, you know, something that happened this morning. So that's called the MEQ30, if you'd like to use that in your research. Pulling across those first two studies, um, we, we, we charged a postdoc with kind of digging into the um, personality data and seeing if we could find some uh, some 
some uh, patterns at play with that kind of larger sample and increased experimental power when combining the studies. And we found that psilocybin increased the construct, the personality construct of openness. So openness refers to um, a broad-minded acceptance of other points of view and appreci appreciation for, for opinions that differ from your, from your own. The ability to hold seemingly mutually um, exclusive ideas at the same time, more of a, I, you know, a both and rather than either or, and an appreciation for aesthetics. And so this is a, this was on the NEO, a validated, very well validated um, personality instrument. And to our knowledge, this was the first experimental study ever, like psychedelic drug or not, to, to ever show a person, a change in a validated personality dimension, which kind of speaks to the potential power of these agents. We know some things like age or, you know, life events like children or marriage or some psychiatric treatments can change personality, but nothing you can like schedule for next Tuesday. And then interestingly, uh, the effect was there statistically um, if we just looked at, you know, the, you know, the administration of the high dose of psilocybin, but digging into the data further, it was clear that the, that the effect was completely driven by people that, who had a so-called full or complete mystical experience, who had substantial endorsement of each of those categories that I mentioned earlier that constitute the mystical experience. So people who had a really high dose of psilocybin who just didn't have one of those experiences for one reason or another, they didn't show the increase in personality openness. So that's interesting. So now I'll move on to some of our nominally um, therapeutic research trying to treat some disorders. So this, this was a study in 51 cancer patients. We were using psilocybin uh, because there was this older research uh, that I mentioned earlier, largely using LSD to treat cancer patients, and it was one of the most promising threads of therapeutic use from that older era. These people had a life-threatening cancer. They weren't necessarily terminal, but they ha it had to be very serious, and even if it was, um, so it had to either have, have had metastasized, or if it hadn't, at least a year had to have passed since the initial diagnosis, and they were still psychologically suffering because of it. So we didn't want to take advantage of just a naturalistic, you know, a few weeks later, a month after the diagnosis, you know, you're doing better, you've gotten, you, you've, you've gotten used to it. Um, so these people were, the pattern was they were going to continually suffer. They had either uh, an, an, a disorder that involved uh, primary um, uh, symptoms of depression, or an anxiety disorder, or both, about, about a third in each. The study design briefly, briefly went like this. Each participant had two sessions. They were five weeks apart. And everyone got either a trivial dose or a high dose. And the trivial dose was one we expected to really have no effects or maybe minimal effect, but it was really just there to cre create an expectancy. We could honestly tell people that you're going to have two psilocybin sessions. It could vary from you know, so low you don't feel it to very high. And, but we didn't tell them it was going to be one very low and one high. We kept them on their toes. They thought, for example, they could have had two high doses. Um, so that was part of the deep blinding. People often say you can't, could never blind you know, psychedelic uh, studies. So you, you can go a long ways in creating, um, minimizing those expectancy effects. So the randomized, the, after screening, um, they're randomized to either receive the high dose first or the low dose first, the trivial dose first, and then five weeks later we assess the psychiatric symptoms. Um, and then they cross over. They have whatever condition they didn't have in the first time, so high dose goes to low dose and vice versa. And then five weeks later we assess the symptoms, the psychiatric symptoms again, and then we have a six-month follow-up. And there are some other meetings in between, but those are the major milestones. So importantly, no serious adverse events. Um, I'm showing you data on the Hamilton depression inventory on the left and the Hamilton anxiety inventory on the right. These are some gold standard measures of these, of these disorders. People were at clinically severe levels for both coming in. People were randomized into the two groups. So the blue group is the trivial dose group and the red is the high. You can see post one is five weeks after that first psilocybin session. 
the people who had, got the high dose had substantial reductions into the non-clinically severe level. I mean, this is not the level where you, you would think the person had any disorder. Um, you saw, also saw a very large reduction in the low gro dose group, but not nearly as large. And that's probably a combination of both placebo effect and just the very strong rapport building, the talking about your life and about how you've been dealing with cancer, all of that with their session guides um, before and during the session. And then, um, and then five weeks after that, you have people experience their other psilocybin session, and five weeks after that, um, you have post two. So now everyone has had the high dose session, whether it was five weeks ago or 10 weeks ago. And remarkably, now everyone is down at that very low level of symptoms. And then the, the really crazy part, I mean, five weeks is pretty crazy. We don't know anything that can treat depression or anxiety like that. You give one dose and it's, it's reduced you know, five weeks later. Same thing at six months. This is from one substantial dose. So ketamine has legitimately considered, been considered a breakthrough in the treatment of depression because its effects for antidepressant effects last you know, um, uh, one to three weeks. And so we're seeing effects that are lasting six months. So same basic pattern with um, anxiety. Going to speed up remarkably. Um, it's not the strongest correlation, but it's a real one. Uh, the, the, the mystical nature of the experience measured you know, after their session, the day of their session, um, showed a significant correlation to the amount of reduction in anxiety and depression. So it's not just having psilocybin, it's the nature of the experience. And we didn't see that relationship if we just measured the strength of the drug effect. It's more of the quality of the experience you have that seems to be therapeutic. I'll go a little more quickly through our smoking research. Um, picking up on the old re older research with LSD and alcoholism, there seemed to be this cross drug kind of uh, applicability. It could treat addiction in general. So we thought, why not try smoking? It's something I had uh, done some research with at that point. There was some interesting press. I, I'll tell you, you we're n we never encourage any psychedelic use because of this research. But I do want to say, definitely don't take this many mushrooms. This is, that's a crazy plate full of mushrooms. Um, there are harms from tobacco smoking. Everyone knows this, heart disease, lung disease. People don't talk about this anymore. Back in the 50s, they talked about it would stunt your growth. This looks like a toddler, but this is a 43-year-old uh, assistant manager at McDonald's on his lunch break. So anyway, and Mr. Mackey from South Park tells us smoking's bad. Okay, we all know that. So these, the important thing here, these were real smokers, been smoking 30-some years. They smoked about a pack a day. It was a 15-week. We combined it with cognitive behavioral therapy, a standard treatment for helping people quit smoking. They had three sessions, moderate to large doses. The first session was when they, on their first sil their target quit date, which you assigned ahead of time, several weeks ahead of time, was the same day that they got their first dose of psilocybin. These are their study visits. Um, this is a metric, a biological metric of smoking. You breathe through a machine to show how much carbon monoxide is in your breath. This is the cutoff from what, showing whether you've been smoking or not. This is when they got psilocybin. This is before psilocybin, this is after. Seems like there's something going on. Um, at six months, what this data showed was 80% of the people were biologically confirmed as, as smoke-free. At, at the average of two and a half years, 60% of people were still smoke-free. Just briefly, you know, this was open label, so we can't really determine whether it was a causal effect of psilocybin. But the question was whether it was promising to follow up. And the answer to that question is yes, because the success rates at six months are substantially better than the best that we have out there in terms of smoking cessation treatment. We found success was related to mystical experience, so you should be picking up a pattern there. Um, we did some qualitative analysis. People reported interconnectedness was important. They had reduced affective or emotional withdrawal symptoms. They reported other benefits like altruism increases. They reported insights into self-identity. We've done some surveys of people who have claimed to quit smoking because of a psychedelic experience. A lot of people there are reporting that as well. We've recently done a survey with people who said they've stopped drinking um, alcohol or reduced alcohol because of a psychedelic experience. That appears to, you know, again, you can't determine causation, but there's a, a landscape of reports out there. And in some structural equation modeling, don't have time to get into that, but 
it suggests that there may be a causal role, we don't know for sure, but that there may be a causal role for mystical experience in the people that have overcome um, an alcohol problem due to a psychedelic experience. We're in the middle of a randomized trial with 80 people comparing psilocybin with nicotine patch for quitting smoking, the same cognitive behavioral therapy. That's just a piece of art one of our participants gave us. Currently, it's still in process. We have uh, more than half to go, but um, right now the success rates at one year after the target quit date, 50% of the people who have received psilocybin are abstinent and 22% with nicotine replacement. And there's just a big mystery in how we are treating these, uh, these different disorders. Um, these are supposed to be different disorders. What's the commonality? I see it as a, they all involve, whether it's depression, whether it's addiction, they involve a narrowing of the mental and behavioral repertoire. And psychedelics have the ability to unstick people, to get you unstuck, you know, in different ways. Michael Pollan recently uh, wrote a book about um, psychedelic research, and he, he, he quoted me with the, the absolutely non-scientific sounding effect called the dope slap effect. But he said basically, people are dope slapped out of their stories. They really come out of these sessions with a profoundly different view of the world, such that, you know, being convinced that, you know, you're a loser and you're a failure, like in depression, or you could never, you know, quit this drug or that drug, people can be shaken out of that and have this increase in self, in self-efficacy. And, um, yeah, we have a lot, hopefully they can point us towards what the endogenous role of serotonin 2A is, and it might have something to do with modulating meaning and mental and behavioral plasticity. And that's it. Thank you all again. Thank you, Matt, for this interesting talk and for the psychedelic jokes. So here we come to the third and the last speaker of the day. Um, so our last speaker is a, a neuroscientist from the University of Melbourne with an expertise in perception, consciousness, as well as in psychedelics. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Olivia Carter. All right. Um, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to participate in this, this conference and this session. It's, um, been, it's extremely interesting. I've sort of, I'll flip onto my, my next slide because I wanted to make the, the point in terms of my general perspective and how I um, approach, I guess, psychedelic research is a little bit different in terms of just really either the clinical aspect or um, the pure um, biological processes associated with the psychedelic state. My interest is very much in understanding the neurobiological factors that support and influence consciousness. Um, so, as no doubt most of you can appreciate, the, the opportunities in terms of understanding the psychedelic experience, in terms of fleshing out the, um, what it is, how does the brain generate a conscious experience, um, is a really important tool. But my research crosses across different tools. It's not, not solely psychedelic. Um, but the work I'm going to present today to do with the psychedelics and this understanding of trying to understand the neurobiological factors that, that influence consciousness, it really presupposes that there's a clarity and, and agreement in the field about what the nature of conscious experience is. Um, and I think it's one... Uh, problem that myself but many people around the world looking at sort of neuroscience is is that we assume that we're looking for a neural correlate of the same thing um, now that I won't go into too much more detail about that but to say that the work I'm going to present today really starts at that first question and ends much closer to the second question and it really comes out of a, a strong collaboration I've had now for the last couple of years with Tim Bain who's a philosopher at Monash, and I'm 
based at Melbourne, so it's geographically close and it's, and it's been interesting. Um, I spent the last, last year on sabbatical in the philosophy department at, at Monash and it's been interesting as a neuroscientist to get a li little bit more confronted with some of the remaining questions um, that, that are really important for the neuroscience as well. Okay, so I'll flip through this really quickly, but as I've said, my interest is, is really in understanding how the brain generates a conscious experience. That I don't have any particular thoughts about whether other systems might also generate conscious experience, but I think it's fairly um, uncontroversial to suggest that the brain is, is, is one system that can do that. So the reason I, I'm interested in psychedelics is because we know so much about them. So this is um, just a, a simple slide in terms of the chemical structure. We understand the chemical structure. Katrin did a great um, job earlier really showing a lot how much we understand about the, the science of, of the psychedelic drugs themselves and their effects on the brain. Um, this slide here is supposed to be overwhelming and what it shows is it's a, it's, a, it's a great, from a great review showing the sort of cartoon schematic of serotonergic um, biochemistry or pharmacology. And, and what this shows is all the different serotonin receptors, 7-HT7 on the microglia, the different types of cells, astrocytes, we've got the postsynaptic post neuron, presynaptic neuron. The point is, is that we understand a lot, we know, understand the structure, we understand um, the different serotonin receptors and that we, it's very clear and, and Katrin's work was, was extremely clear in showing the importance of the serotonin 2A receptor in these effects. So there's something very uh, special or selective about the 2A receptor. Um, we also know that it activates the one, psilocybin activates the 1A receptor, um, but through studies like those described in the, in the first talk, it's clear that most of the psychedelic effects that people report can really be attributed to activation of the 2A receptor. So if you're interested in trying to understand how the brain is generating conscious experience, there's a, there's a lot that's going on in the brain that has nothing at all to do with consciousness. So, the fact that we, we have this sort of selective um, entry point, I guess, into, into the brain function is really interesting to me. Um, okay, the other thing I think is, is important is that this sort of this selectivity in science is, is really helpful if you're trying to understand what process ends up in, in what um, outcome. So, um, so all this is, is very non-scientific. This is me in the Google images just writing something like psychedelic art. And you, you do something, you search terms, something like that, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of images like this. The point is simply that these, these images, they're very unusual images, okay? It's not standard images, but they're also not random. Okay? There's a lot of similarity across these different things. If the effects of psychedelics were totally random, they would not be very helpful for a, in terms of a scientific um, approach to consciousness. So I'll, I'll just flip, flip over. Um, so a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today is based on, on questionnaire subjective experience uh, reports. Now, the, a lot of the work that, that I'll be talking about really is based off this um, altered states of consciousness rating scale. As, as we heard um, in the last talk, there are different rating scales and they're all extremely interesting. I think that there's a lot of data that's available in those. Um, in this case, um, I chose, chose this one largely because I was familiar with it, but also for the huge number of participants that have gone through and had controlled uh, research sort of experiences, um, which you might quite rightly say that's not really a, a sort of true psychedelic experience. You should be in the forest and with your friends and such things. But at least it's controlled, so you can really get a sense of what is the impact of the drugs on these different experiences. Now, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today was really based on a, a sort of extensive review of the literature that I did last year, as well as looking at some of the, the work that I was involved in. But I have to say, even I was really shocked I had forgotten how much research had been done. You know, we've heard this today a little bit, that there's been a lot of ongoing work in the past. Here we've got um, 327 separate psilocybin sessions that have been, some of them it's like the same person has come 
on, on, and receive two doses, so there might not be 327 separate participants. That's a lot of research that's been done with these drugs. And this, this is all, this is um, work that's come out of, of Franz Vollenweider's lab and was subject to a really impressive cluster analysis that was published um, in 2010. So even that number is, is an underestimation because that was in 2010, it's obviously a lot higher now. And so what they did, I'll flip back, this is the last slide. In this uh, rating scale, there's just a lot of questions. Simply, you know, I saw brightness or flashes of light with closed eyes or in complete darkness. No, not more than usually. Yes, much more than usually. So on placebo, most people say, you know, well, you may have felt to some extent one with your surroundings, but as usual, okay? So that's how it, that's how it sort of works. And the idea of this cluster analysis was basically to see which, which part, which types of experiences reported together. Um, okay, and, and this is, it's the same data that's just presented in a, in a uh, subsequent review. It's a great review if anyone's interested. And the really important point here, so what they've done, just to take you, take you through it, so what they've done is they, they basically found these, these clusters, experience of uni that, that seem to um, uh, build onto uh, subsets of questions. And here they've just plotted that in a nice sort of spider diagram and have these, these cluster headings. So things like elementary visual alterations, vivid imagery, insightfulness, uh, religious experience, these sorts of things. The, the point that I want to make here that again is sort of really interesting from the scientific side of things is that first of all, it's, it's selective to the drug. So this is ketamine. So people report very extreme changes in their experience, but the point is it's, it's different, okay? This is, an, again, that, that sort of selectivity is really important. And um, the other really important thing is it's dose responsive, okay? So on low doses, medium doses, and higher doses, you get the same pattern effects, but in a systematically increased way, which, which really gives you some sort of confidence that the effect you're, you're looking at is, is really driven by the, the drug. Um, the, the work that I'll, I'll talk about in the next few slides is really built on that uh, cluster analysis of those 300 odd um, subjective ratings and also just some, some basic uh, lab-based experimental work that I did and, and a review of other um, previously published work that was really looking at not so much the clinical effects of these drugs, but looking at the impact on basic cognitive and perceptual processing. Um, so this is just a, some, of the, some of the work that I did when I was working, um, I did my PhD in the lab with uh, Franz Vollenweider. Okay, so if I flip back to what I said in the first slide, that my interest is primarily understanding consciousness um, as opposed to the psychedelic experience itself. Um, working with, with Tim Bain, we basically took a step back and said, right, what can we learn from the psychedelic experience that will inform consciousness science? And so what are the sorts of things that are currently being talked about a lot in, in theories of consciousness and um, yeah, in, in aspects that are considered really fundamental to, to consciousness itself? So in the end, we we settled on, on uh, perception. We really wanted to make a focus on perception. Uh, it's very clearly an important thing that's, that's often part of descriptions of conscious experience. It's cognitive function. There's a, a major theory at the moment in terms of the global workspace theory um, through Dahan's group, but many other people that really say that the role of consciousness is the, the, the basic idea is that consciousness is the transmission of the different, um, either the, the, I guess the different modalities are around the locating different parts of the brain. So you've got the, the auditory cortex and the visual cortex and language processing. And the filter, a lot of information is processed unconsciously and the theory goes that to the extent that information is broadcast to other parts of the brain, well, that's sort of what consciousness is. And it's, and it's done in that way so that you can have this global workspace that's held in working memory and you can really plan for the future and, and do all these sorts of things. Um, self and unity is another really big component of consciousness, the idea of a pers perspective relative to yourself or the environment. Some people say that that's the fundamental thing that, that consciousness provides for us. And another aspect which is something that Tim um, has written a lot about and, and is current 
Some would say, I know I'm now totally buy into Tim's argument that it's a highly simplistic view of consciousness as some sort of unidimensional thing. That, that you see these types of figures replicated hundreds of times in journals or papers looking at lower states of consciousness, coma, and it's useful to think about how, you know, you can have people that show changes in arousal, they'll have eyes opening, um, but cannot respond, you know, they've had a traumatic brain injury, but they seem to be waking up and going to sleep again, and there's a distinction, is the vegetative state, well, having, being awake is not enough in the clinical setting to give a, a clinician and the, the confidence that the person is really having substantial conscious experiences. So they have this separation out. And there is, in the popular press, and, and sometimes in academic writing as well, you get the sense that the psychedelic states are considered to be a higher state of consciousness for whatever, whatever that means. And I guess it's the whatever that means that was the a real motivation of this, of this study, is to think about in what ways can consciousness change? Um, can it, does it all go up in one direction or, or does it pull apart in different dimensions? Okay, so if I get started on, on the sort of perception side of things, I'll go through um, those different sections uh, systematically. Uh, so just to explain what I'm showing here, because it's, it's relevant to the next few slides as well, that this is just a snapshot of that first diagram with the cluster analysis, and you have here that this was the headings that have been provided, that elementary visual alternations and such things, but this is the actual text of the question or the type of question that, that was um, included in that cluster. So, elementary visual alternations, I saw colours before me in total darkness with eyes closed. And as you presume you're experiencing yourself, if you just close your eyes right now, you're probably not going to experience those sorts of things. And people report those very highly on, on after taking uh, psychedelics. Vivid imagery, I saw scenes rolling by in total darkness or with eyes closed. My imagination was extremely vivid. Then there are, I've sort of coded this with ticks versus question marks. So the things around me had a strange new meaning. In the case of something like I was seeing things that were not otherwise there, you know, that then it's a clear, if we're looking at this from consciousness sort of perspective, well, this drug, whatever consciousness is, and if you're thinking about it from the perceptual side of things, it's somehow boosting that. It's creating content where there was otherwise no content. So to the extent that you want to put a positive or negative um, sort of code on, on, on these experiences, that's clear. But then there are a lot that don't really fit all that clearly into the big consciousness theories, but it's still interesting, okay? Is it, how do we treat a strange new meaning for me, especially in some contexts. In these contexts, it's hard to know if that meaning was a correct meaning or not. Okay, so in terms of the lab-based psychophysics, so that's where someone, you know, stuck in front of a computer screen and given a lot of really uh, sensitive tasks. I'll show you one slide next at what type of thing that involves. So it's really good detailed lab-based e evidence that sensory inhibition is reduced, sensory gating is reduced, um, saccadic frequency, so it's eyes moving around, is increased, and so just together, that basically paints a picture that there's less sensory inhib inhibition. So it does give you this, it sort of paints a common picture that there's maybe more sensory um, signaling experienced or, or making it through from the environment. But it is also interesting, I won't go into more detail about this, that one of the most common things that people report is, is colour, you know, colours are brighter and um, more intense and more salient and all of those things, which is undeniably, and you see the pictures uh, from, the, from Google, it's undeniably a, a key feature of the experience. But actually in a lab experiment, the, the capacity to distinguish between different hues, um, how am I, can I ask how, I, how am I going for time, good, um, uh, is, is not improved. In fact, it's, it's worse, so that the, the actual ability to, to see the, the different colours is, is worse, and the contrast sensitivity, so the brightness, you're no more sensitive to, to uh, so just as a just a one sort of example of the types of studies that I was doing that would lead to something like those conclusions. So we had two. This is just one of the things we did. We had two uh, types of stimuli. Um, one is just simple motion um, and this very boring sort of thing, just grading. It's moving left to right. The task is to say, is it moving left or right? Very complicated. Um, and then if you get it correct, it gets more and more faint. 
So eventually people can't see it. There's no capacity to detect those lines there. Um, and well, this is, uh, oh, I haven't got the colours. Anyway, the, the, the white is that task. There's no effect on the psilocybin, so people showed no increase in sensitivity to just the, the, the contrast. Um, and that's in, in, an important thing because it says that basically the information that's entering into the brain is the same. Okay? There's, you're not actually accessing more information from the external world. Um, the second task was something called coherent motion. And in that case, instead of having things getting more faint, you basically have a lot of dots moving around and a subset of those dots move perfectly coherently. And the human brain is extremely good at, at sort of binding these types of, of patterns. And what you end up experiencing is a sort of chaotic movement of dots in the background. But even if you have like three dots out of 100 moving together, you, you see that as a kind of transparent film moving across, that those, those coherently moving dots are very clearly grouped together, typically. And that was the one thing that, that um, was significantly impaired even at this really sort of basic level. And um, just sort of anecdotally, so we don't really have evidence to, for this, but people, what they would report is not that they couldn't see the dots that were moving, um, it was more that they could see all of the dots. All the, back, all the dots that were moving randomly seemed to be more sparkly and more distracting. And it fits with that, that just self-report really fits with uh, this sort of uh, this type of thing where there's just less suppression of the irrelevant information, I guess, task irrelevant information. Um, okay. All right, so in terms of if cognition, looking at uh, attention and, and memory, first of all, it's interesting that, uh, that the, even the labelling of the, the questions was, was framed in the negative. I actually hadn't even, you know, I've administered this questionnaire many, many times, but I hadn't myself really digested that, that, that the questions are not... In the, in the perception side, did you see more colours and more this? It's all, this is all in the negative. I had difficulty making even the smallest decisions. I had difficulty uh, distinguishing important from unimportant things. I was not able to complete a thought. My thoughts repeatedly became disconnected. Um, this is one item that was not uh, grouped in with this, this, these cognitive ones, but it gives a similar sort of flavour. Conflicts and contradictions seem to dissolve. So I've, I've given it a cross in terms of Functionally, that doesn't sound very positive, uh, but certainly they, these types of effects reach significance in terms of what people self-report. Uh, again, in the lab-based experiments, we've got the speech production is worse, uh, language complexity is worse, people really stop talking, basically. Um, reading appears to be un, unaffected. Um, it's interesting with the, the tension and working memory, a lot of those are, are divided attention. Whenever there's a, a sort of selection of something against alternatives, it was much uh, more impaired. Some of the uh, like sustained attention in the absence of a distracting, that's, that's what sustained attention is. Um, in the absence of distraction, just paying attention seemed to be unimpaired. Uh, but mental manipulation and some of the working memory tasks were un unaffected. And again, I'll just really quickly spin you through this. So, so the types of thing that we did, was we had, this is a very difficult task on, on magic mushrooms, um, there's the 20 green dots moving around and a few red dots. And the person would have to report, like click a button, and the red dots would go green. And their task was just to pay attention to the dots that had previously been um, red. And then at the end, they'd be asked, well, which of these was one of your red target dots? People had all sorts of problems with this and all sorts of, they, I don't wanna, they say, I don't want to push the button because it's like the red dots are fighting against the green dots, and if I push the button for the red dots, then they'll be handed over to the green dots, and then, you know, I'll be, I'll be sort of, um, I don't know, yes. Um, and other people say, oh, it's like um, I'm looking on top of a, um, I remember one person saying it was like a ro rollerblading uh, restaurant. So um, these guys are the waiters, and they're sort of going around, and I'm looking from above, and they're the trays that are they're sort of serving all these people in a really chaotic, chaotic restaurant. So there's a lot going on here. As you can imagine, that's not it. So it became extremely hard for people to keep attention, paying attention to the dots that they were previously paying attention to. Um, in, in contrast, this task was a spatial working memory task, and it was just a series of, of things. So, you know, that would change colour, and then that one would change colour, and then they'd be presented with an empty screen, and you had to go like this. And 
people reached ceilings. So they, the, the thing went up to nine, a sequence of nine. Um, which we had a lot of sort of medical students in our, our group, and they, they all hit that sort of nine. So a lot of them did as well as you could do. But it was interesting that if the way this worked, that if you made a mistake, you got three goes at that level. So if you, you do a sequence of two, and if you got it wrong, you could do it again. As long as you got it right on the third, by, within three goes, you'd get to the next level. And people would make a few more mistakes if, for example, you know, a door closed down the corridor or someone got distracted, then they would completely lose what they were doing. But on the next trial, if they paid attention and could focus, they, they would do all right. Um, OK. Uh, so moving to the, the final main one, experience of, of unity. This was something that was, was, became really interesting to us. Um, these are the, the types of questions. Everything seemed to unify into oneness. It seemed to me that my environments and I were one. I experienced a touch of eternity. This is that conflicts and contradictions seemed to dissolve. I experienced past, present, future as oneness. So very strong effects in this direction. It's really hard to, to know how to sort of frame that within consciousness science more generally. Um, in terms of time perception, uh, there's interval matching and beat synchronization was either unaffected or, or impaired a little bit. Uh, reproduction of temporal intervals, no, um, the, the modal com completion with Kinesa uh, figures was also impaired. This is the type of thing we had here where you see, uh, hopefully you can see a, a kind of illusory boundary. That's the idea is that people normally experience um, this kind of edge and they, they now know in the brain where all that happens so it's not really a, a mystery. But even that uh, was reduced and it came in a way, comes a, you come away with a kind of um, summary, I guess, of this is that it's like a, a reduction in boundariness, for, what it, for want of a better word. Um, doesn't seem to matter so much if it's space, self, and time, and, or even uh, contradictions and um, if con conceptual boundaries also seem to dissolve, uh, which I'm not sure, I mean, we haven't made a huge deal of it, but I haven't heard that talked about so much in terms of not just the self boundaries dissolving, but actually, uh, all these things seem to go together. Okay, so summarising all of these, this work together in terms of lessons for consciousness science, um, first of all, I agree with, with, with Tim, his main point, that a unidimensional account of consciousness, that any single moment of consciousness could be ordered above or below. It doesn't mean it has to be a linear thing, but you could take any person in the room or any person in a different state and put one person on top of the other in terms of uh, conscious level is very hard to uh, what's reconcile with, with, with this data. And it sort of shows that in terms, maybe in, in, from, in terms of perception, in terms of intensity of experience, diversity of experience, volume of experience, for want of a better word, maybe that's increased. Cognitive function definitely not increased. And this unity boundaries uh, are, really dissolve on these um, drugs. Yeah, so just to say that, that this, this, what I've just talked about has now been um, published in the Neuroscience of Consciousness. I think it also really speaks against this view, this, this um, sort of ordered view of, of consciousness. I mean, in, in a practical sense, that has real implications. There was recently a paper that came out suggesting that we should give psychedelics as a treatment for disorders of consciousness. Now, to me, having looked at the literature, that doesn't seem like a great idea and seems potentially quite dangerous depending on what aspects you're enhancing or reducing. If you've got someone with brain trauma and they're having some pain experience but reduced cognitive capacities, it's hard to see how this would be a positive thing for people in that state. But, um, okay, so in, in terms of more theoretical approaches to consciousness, there are a lot of different theories that really assume that there is this total ordering, whether it's the complexity theories or entropy or IIT, which is uh, integrated information theory by Giulio Tononi. They all suggest you can kind of get one number that captures all of consciousness. And I think um, it's, it's, really, it's really important to think very clearly about what that number is really capturing. Is it capturing all of these things that we consider consciousness or is it just one dimension? Um, in terms of the global workspace and the, the work um, by Standard Hands Group, 
it's very, very clear what his, his theories uh, say about the, the role of the cognitive system. So it refers to the relationships between a cognitive system and a specific object of thought. This object appears to be selected for further processing, including the verbal and nonverbal report. It's only that which is globally available constitutes the con content of consciousness. So it's really this very functional approach, and it's all about the selection, which seems to be the really one thing that's impaired on these drugs. Um, Self-monitoring and metacognition, this gets sort of more to self. Another meaning of consciousness is reflexive. It refers to self-referential relationships in which the cognitive system is able to monitor its own processing and obtain information about itself. I think it's also really Im Im important, we didn't really write this in, in the paper, it's just a, a comment really. Um, there's still not very good reasons or explanations about why consciousness evolved, what it has added to us. There might be people in this room might have specific opinions, but there's certainly not an agreed benefit that we've we gained from consciousness. And it's certainly, in terms of the psychedelic state, there's a lot of ways that you can think. I mean, I think it's, I think it's very helpful to think about in what ways the, the psychedelic state is enhancing and, and those in which it's not. And I think that that itself will be informative in terms of understanding evolution and more functional aspects. We've already heard both speakers talk about, you know, not driving a car. I wouldn't really want my babysitter to be, you know, on psychedelics. So in terms of things we consider fundamental to humanity, it's important to think about um, what these drugs are doing and, and probably inappropriate to think about them as being some sort of optimal state of human uh, existence. Um, this is my, the final slide, just in terms of future directions. I, I do, uh, in case my last few slides sounded a, a bit negative, I think it's really exciting that, that what the psychedelics can offer the science of consciousness. This is a paper that was written by Tim and Jakob with Adrian Owen. Um, really looking at, at, at coma and understanding lower states of consciousness. And they wrote this paper, this is, you know, the scientist to the, the philosopher, I've learned a lot from them, but it gets me angry when they write this amazing paper and it's just sort of, well, there'll be different dimensions, like, and I'll just label them one, two, three, four, five, six. And I sort of, I, I feel like one thing that, that altered states, research into altered states of consciousness can do, whether through meditation or other things, is start really trying to map out what are these dimensions, what's the meat on the dimensions. Is there something like bandwidth of, of experience? How much sensory information you can, can be you know, consumed by in any one moment? Is that, does accuracy count? The colour stuff is interesting. People report very intense increase in sort of salience of colour, but actually the accuracy of that, that judgement is it seems to separate out a bit from the external world. Um, manipulation, global workspace, self-representation and boundaries to really try to think about and particularly in the clinical setting well maybe these measures are tapping onto one of these things we need to think from clinically which ones do we care more about um, or should we be valuing some ab above the others anyway, that's it, thank you Thank you, Olivia, for this uh, amazing talk. Um, here with, I think I would like to um, ask all the speakers to come for the question and answer session. We'll be alternating between the two queues, so if you have a question, please queue wherever it's shorter. And we have about 40 minutes for a decent discussion, so. We can start from here. Um, thank you for your very interesting lectures. My question is for all um, speakers, and it might be uh, perhaps too intimate, and uh, so feel free to answer it or reject it. Since I'm very interested in first-person research and the role of the researcher in research, I would be interested if you have own experiences with psychedelic uh, substances, and if yes, if this, that, uh, that has a um, certain impact of uh, the motivation in your research. We're clearly all jumping at that question. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to go 
go ahead. So it's something that I've thought long and hard about, and I'll tell you, you know, I'm not going to give you an answer. Um, I'll, I'll take the politician's route out and just, like, answer something different. Um, but I, I think there, you know, if, if someone said that they had had a psychedelic experience or two, maybe back in college or whatever, you know, a whole lot of people would say, wow, you're biased, you're doing this for a reason, I don't really trust anything you're doing. And if you said, no, I've never had, been interested, but I've never had a psychedelic experience, a lot of other people would say, you have absolutely no business doing this to people, you don't know what you're getting into, so you're, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. And I think looking in, the, there's a lot of history, lessons in the history of this research that went back from the 50s to the 70s. And one of the, you know, Tim Leary, I think one of the lessons we can draw from him is you got to really be careful about making this about your experience rather than the experiences that you are studying from your volunteers. So I think there's a wisdom in really not, not addressing that question. But I do think very, very strongly that a more important question that I can answer that underlies that question is do you have an appreciation for the, the, the depth and the uniquely human experiences that people can have on these compounds and are you doing everything you can to um, have empathy for your volunteers? And I think the answer to that question is yes, as best as, best as we can and I think it's critical. Some of the early research wasn't done well because, you know, the white lab coats and just sort of with, without any appreciation that someone might have, be having the most intense experience of their life. So, so thank you for a diplomatic answer. I'm, okay. I'm happy to give, I feel like I'm a relatively conservative psychedelic researcher, but I'm happy to give an answer, to, an actual answer to that question. And maybe it's because the research that I was doing involved participants sitting at a desk and actually having to follow things like crazy dots around the place. Every, I come from, you know, after, anyway, all the research that I've done, it is absolutely traditional that you, you have to know whether the stimulus is working. Most of the vision types of research that's ever done normally includes the first author as one of the subjects because vision is, is pretty stable. So, but there's a lot of really boring reasons why studies won't work. And I also feel like there's a slightly ethical sort of, this is, I mean, I, the studies I was doing was not to improve depression or treat death anxiety or, or um, you know, addiction or anything like that. It's for interest, interest, like purely sort of um, self-indulgent interest in terms of understanding how the brain works and what it's doing. And so I absolutely took the different doses and made sure that it was completely like feasible for participants to do the tasks that I was trying to get them to do. I should say that having that experience while on drugs trying to do my study, it was a very surreal experience and I spent most of the time thinking, what the hell? There's no part of this experience that has anything to do with the dots on the screen, you know, but still. Um, but I've also been participant in, in brain stimulation research and I, see, I feel like that sort of stuff is, it's just as, you know, we don't know what's going on and, and they, you, you enroll all these first year undergrads and you give them course credit or $20 and say, here you can have a psychedelic or you will give a big magnet and sap your brain for an hour. Um, I think it's important that researchers will, to the extent that it's healthy, you're studying healthy people, if, if you're not prepared to do it yourself, you've got to, you know, it's, I think it's not fair to ask healthy controls to do it too. I should also say I've had very bad experiences on the drugs too, so I'm not a an ad, ad, overall advocate, I think it's, yeah, I think it's a balanced approach is useful. You don't have to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I go with Matt. You go with Matt, okay. Okay, well, we move yeah, over. We, you know. This is for the, uh, the, the mystical experience talk. Uh, it's partly a quite pedantic point, but I think it's something more than that. When, when you're talking about James's characterizations and you characterize that his, when he says they have a noetic feel, as saying they have a self-validating quality. But my understanding is something more specific than that. What he means by that is they present themselves as forms of knowing, as knowing of a, of a reality outside of the individual experience. And I think that's important because it, if that's right, it means they have content, they're sort of, which, and if it's, you know, they're true or false, we have, to say, we have to say that they are either hallucinations or they're genuine insights into a transcendent, ineffable reality. Um, so I think, you know, if that's right, we can't 
that's got to be a factor of how we're thinking about them. We can't just say, are they, we can't just think about are they useful, are they pleasurable, are they harmful. Insofar as we're thinking that they do have content, um, that's an important aspect of them. But also, it might be relevant in how we're thinking about, to some extent, if we're thinking of them as harmful or beneficial. If you know, if you do think they're genuine insights, then that's going to be beneficial. If you think they're hallucinations, that's got to be part of a harmful thing in some sense. But it seems you know we've, that's an important aspect and something we need to forces us to take a stand somehow. Sure, Are, sir. You're suggesting self-validating isn't a quick. You know, of course, it, it didn't have several yeah. minutes to, to explain each of the sure. features, but, Might have just but I mean, just do you think it's kind of quintessentially in the wrong direction or just an incomplete? No, maybe it was just shorthand, but I just okay. think, and you know, I'm yeah. not criticizing you, sure, I'm just sure. saying that's got to be, if, if he's right about that, that they are states with content, that's got to be part of how we yeah. think about them, part we think about whether they're good or bad as well. And oh. yeah. yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll look into that. That's uh, thankful for that point. Hi, this is mostly for Dr. Johnson, but uh, anyone's uh, opinions would be interesting. Uh, about the cancer fear, uh, you're basically treating acute trauma in what you're doing, and so I'm wondering if you had thought about or, uh, or one, did, you, did participants have any history of trauma or abuse in their past of any of your participants, and do you think that this could be a treatment for uh, you know, acute PTSD or complex PTSD is coming as a clinician. So I'll jump to the end, yes. And okay. I hope to be doing that work hopefully sooner than later. Okay. Um, and yes, people had, uh, so the cancer-related depression and anxiety isn't described in the DSM or the ICD, but it's a real thing and it is qualitatively different and there's an emerging literature um, on that outside of psychedelics. Um, so I'm convinced that it's a distinct thing. And I think trauma, whether it's, it is a fair way to describe that, whether you're talking about an acute event or something more protracted, and there were certainly acute events. I mean, one of our patients was a, um, actually a physician herself and, and was, had a horrific experience of being intubated by her own colleagues. I mean, just hellish experience. I mean, there were participants who had had dozens of surgeries and just stuff that, I mean, it just boggles the mind to yeah. think about the suffering that, you know, some of these people have gone, had gone through. And then broadly speaking across a number of studies, gosh, I mean, you prepare someone to like go into the study to quit smoking and guess what? Sexual childhood trauma comes up. Like, and that's where you really got to prepare people. Like, that stuff you have stuffed down in the corner of the basement, you know, take an account, because any, any of it could come up. So I, I think there's incredible potential. I think certainly the literature on MDMA and, and PTSD treatment is extremely promising. Everything is in the realm of anecdote with the classic psychedelics, but there's some pretty interesting, compelling anecdotes. I think we got to be especially careful that it's done right and be cautious to not re-traumatize people. I mean, the literature more broadly on trauma treatment is that you have to have this right balance. You have to have this safe environment where you don't re-traumatize, and that's why a lot of people don't continue with what we know works, prolonged exposure therapy, these types of things, because it's, it's, yeah, it it's seems, too much. It so. seems, and it's obviously not the same, but analogous to EMDR a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank, you. Oh, thank you. On this side, please. Yeah. Yes, this question is for Matthew. Um, at, the, at the Conference for Medicine and Religion that's co-sponsored by Harvard, University of Chicago, a number of reputable universities, a paper was presented by Dr. Bolins, and he had almost identical ham charts that you have based on, not well, based solely on meditative prayer. And it begs the question, how much of what research you're doing is really a placebo effect? Now, you must have asked that question of yourself, I assume by giving a very uh, minimal dose, to an inactive dose, if you will, to some patients, which means to me to believe maybe that was your attempt to not have to legally inform the patient they were getting a placebo and you were considering that as a possible issue. My question is, shouldn't we be looking at this, did you look at it as, re as you did the re literature search, and shouldn't we be comparing these things directly? To something else like meditation or this, 
Sure. Um, I mean, one of the cool things about being in this field is like, you know, so many of the questions are, you know, why not do this study? Why? And, and the answer is like, yeah, that's really interesting. We should be doing that. And so hopefully the field is going to grow enough so that, you know, and the lack of funding and, but, well, you know, you know and, and specific funding for that. So if you know someone who wants to fund that, you know, well, like, well, you know, we should, we you, should talk. But that's it. Yeah, were you aware of that research when you did your um, literature? Well, search? yeah, more, yeah, more, not on the very particular. Uh, oh, I think that yeah, that you're talking about, but but in generally the therapeutic effects of these, um, you know, non pharmacological mm -hmm. interventions like in, in, you know, meditation, et cetera. I mean, in therapy, you know, more broadly in terms of non um, pharmacological yeah. interventions. A direct, but yeah, 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 a direct uh, comparison is really needed. I think. Thank you. Right, 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 right. So I, yeah, I would agree with that. That would be incredibly um, interesting. And clear, you know, I, th I think just very quickly what we're doing, clearly it's not just the pharmacology. It's absolutely dependent on the context or the so-called set and setting. But also clearly it's not purely a placebo because we do in study after study see a clear distinction between psilocybin and some comparator compound or a high dose of psilocybin and a low dose of psilocybin. Okay, thanks. Thank you for this wonderful symposium. Um, and speaking of doses, my question is regarding um, this relationship that you found. Um, well, this question is more for Dr. Preller, actually, um, with high doses um, leading to increased chances of a mystical and very meaningful experience. Um, what kind of time scale, like what would be your sense of when to do the imaging and see um, if these long-term effects are sustained, especially the thalamic filtering, and uh, what would be thoughts on that? Um, so it's, it's a tough question because I don't have a clear answer for that. So, but the first thing I want to say, I really hope that the thalamic filtering is not sustained because, I mean, this is clearly underlying the acute effects and we don't want this to be sustained at all. Um, because as um, Dr. Carter mentioned, that's not, um, so we don't function well under the acute influence of uh, LSD or other psychedelics. Um, the sustained effects, I mean, um, especially the, the group by Roland Griffith has shown um, sustained effects, I think, ranging from one month to 14 months. Um, so I think it's really, it, it really depends on what exactly you're looking for, but there won't be a clear answer, but that's, you know, a question we need to answer in, in future studies. Okay, thank you. Sir? Uh, the, uh, these compounds were uh, formerly called mind-altering or consciousness-expanding ex uh, drugs back in the 60s and 70s. And I wonder, uh, in view of the coloration between the mythical, uh, mystical experience and the antidepressant effect, isn't the mind altering the crucial aspect of, of this therapeutic effect? Uh, I wonder what uh, Matthew thinks about it and also the others, because that would be a new paradigm of looking at drug effects, not receptor-based or not so much. Of course, the, this is an, uh, an important aspect, but mind-based. So this would be sort of a, a mind-based therapy, which uh, imp implies uh, a meaningful alteration of, uh, of an experience. Uh, and I think this would be uh, something absolutely new in, in pharmacology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, let's see. Um, I absolutely a, a, a agree with the idea that, and, and we have evidence for this, that it's, you could state it different ways, but it, it's, it's about the effects on the mind. And, and so those correlations we have across different, uh, uh, different disorders, that it is the, more the, the nature of the experience, the quality of experience, rather than just the, how strong the drug effect is that is predictive of therapeutic response. I think ult ultimately mystical experience, you know, we're gonna look back and see it as a really crude metric and who knows whether some of those dimensions need, should deserve to be lumped together or not, but yeah. you know, it's something and there are different scales which we've, which we've talked about, um, but there's something about the nature, the quality of the experience. And in that realm, I ha it relates to a point I had to go fa really fast past in my, as I was running out of time, but one of my final points was, uh, this is really a, a medication-facilitated psychotherapy, and that's the way it differs from almost the entire paradigm of modern psychiatry. But the one thing I'd slightly disagree on is it's not new, because in fact, 
this was not only in the era of psychedelic research from the 50s to the early 70s, but it wa also wasn't uncommon to use drugs to facilitate talk therapy, whether it be an amphetamine type stimulant to get people talking, mm. and, and you know, for a quiet person undergoing psychoanalysis, get them talking right. with something, yeah. Yeah. or the administration of a barbiturate mm. to relax somebody. So this, more broadly speaking, actually was more of a thing you know, back until the, f the 60s, and then it really just fell out of, of fashion. So it's, in some sense, a return to that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, one on this side, please. My question is to Katrin, please. In your whole brain plots, I saw the cerebellum is nicely dark blue. Does it mean it lost the connection to the cerebral cortex, or did it just die off, and what did it do? So um, this particular analysis, it basically correlates every point we have in the brain, every voxel, with the rest of the brain. Um, so we, from this analysis, we cannot say that it's offline at all, um, but it's less connected to the rest of the brain in general. So it might still be that, for example, one part of the cell baron is highly connected with one part of the cortex. However, in average, it's less strongly co uh, correlated or connected. And that is kind of the that's, the, that's why I presented a different analysis as well, which is able to give us more information on you know, the connection between two specific brain areas. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's, it's offline at all, but it's certainly less well connected. Thank you. On that side, please. Okay, yeah, I, um, Matthew, I guess this is primarily directed toward you, but your, your talks seem to be aimed at the uh, mystical and other effects of the uh, LSD exper experience, um, but rather than that as a kind of help in psychotherapy, because, for example, uh, this was hinted at by a speaker before, what happens with all the meditators that have their experience, spending years um, in yoga or whatever, uh, is that experience the same as taking a pill? Um, what about psych and the stress that uh, people come to you with? Um, the, the stress problem is still there. Has the pill sub uh, taken away the, the, the issue that made them get stressful and gave them trauma? Uh, so how much of this approach that you're giving is solving problems of psychotherapy, of the mystical experience of meditators, is that the same mystical experience? Um, and, uh, and also the, the 60s, it seems a little strange why suddenly LSD with Huxley and all the proponents suddenly that died out. Um, if it was so effective, maybe they didn't know back then, but Huxley was advertising all about it. So I'm just asking, in view of what one speaker said, I wouldn't want my housekeeper to be on LSD. Um, are you suggesting, how much are you suggesting about these ways of knowing? Uh, knowing in what sense? The, the Tibetan sense? Um, for example, there's one more thing. There's a, a tribe, I forget their name. They take this substance, but only members of the tribe. Because for the outsider, it's just a high. But for the insider in their culture, it means something totally different. So maybe if you could just sort of define this ways of knowing a little better, I'd appreciate it. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, there were a number of things there. I'll, I'll do my best to kind of touch on what I can recall. Um, one thing I think it's important to, to note, like we're, we're absolutely not encouraging any use of this uh, you know, out for the general population. Um, these drugs have been used, you know, they didn't go away in the 60s, so They've, you know, maintained kind of a stable niche in the, you know, illicit drug world. Um, we don't encourage use. We, I'm always you know, very cautious to be, I usually spend the first, you know, quarter or third of my talk, like, letting you know, like I did today. There's a lot of, you know, there are very real risks. Um, and then you heard, um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of Olivia's talk, especially, like, in terms of acutely, like, yeah, it's not improving function, like getting things done in your day. So... There's been a lot of that here today. Um, so, you know, you know I, I think we can address what we can address. Uh, our data are on the use of these substances in very particular 
uh, in a particular context that has absolutely done everything that we know to do to address the known risks um, and to optimize the efficacy. In terms of, um, I think your point about the mystical experience and how it's ultimately having its leading perhaps to the therapeutic effects, I, I think you're right on and that, that's a big area where I, I imagine, I hope that we're gonna figure a lot out in the coming decades because that's a big hand wavy jump between you know this sort of, I mean people say things pretty routinely after these sessions, yeah it's like doing years of psychotherapy in an afternoon, like what does that really mean? My best guess, my best way, and it's from you know the, my gut reaction, I don't have specific explicit you know, research questions that I've addressed around this, but my gut reaction from what I've seen is when it works to affect someone's well-being long-term, it's because the experience sets in motion changes in the person's, it opens this, this window of mental flexibility or insight where someone starts to change the way they are living their life. And only if that happens, and you gotta start doing it in the short term because there's this thing like an afterglow, it's not gonna last forever. Um, if you start to implement, you know, if you think you've received lessons, you better start putting them to work or otherwise this is just gonna be some memory. And um, Houston Smith, I mean, has discussed this at length in his work, you know, the so-called spiritual experience does not necessarily lead to the spiritual life. So one has to put in a lot of work and putting it more secularly, you know, if you have lessons about how to improve your psychology after these, these experiences, like, you've got to do a whole lot of work. So we have a lot to figure out there, but I think you're right on. Can I, can I add just, there's a, a number of questions and I possibly a number more questions I feel like often in psychedelic research, people almost force you, or there's an assumption that it's pitting meditation against psychedelic sort of experiences. And I personally think that that's really the wrong way to interpret any of this, this research or the, or the field. Um, I've, I've personally been involved in some meditation research. I think meditation is extremely interesting. From the from the science, like the sorts of things that I was doing, it's really hard because every different person doing a different type of meditation is experiencing a slightly different thing or doing a slightly different thing. So, from from a really boring sense, it's a, it's different to selectively activating the serotonin two A receptor, and it's I can imagine, and I you know I think meditation is extremely interesting, but it's also if you're facing someone with terminal cancer. The, the, some question was, has the stress gone away? Well, well no. <laughs> the stress has not gone away. The person is still going to die of cancer. Um, so the idea that one is better than the other, I think there's risks to meditation. Meditation has to be done in a serious way and in a guided way. But I think it's not helpful if there's a feeling that it's what's coming out of the psychedelic literature, that it is that everything that everyone says about meditation just quicker and faster or, or anything like that. It's not... I, I've, it's often interpreted like that. I've never heard a psychedelic researcher really say that. And, and I think very quickly what we see across our different therapeutic studies is people handling those stressors just in a better way. So the fear of death may still be there, but now you've moved from it absolutely crippling someone's life so they, like, they, they're never doing, they, they're living in hell every day, and now they're getting out playing with their grandkids while they, while they still can, and they realize that they are locking themselves in when they're still physically able to do those things and live a life. And then in the, in the case of smoking cessation, yeah, there are still usually withdrawal, but people will often report that they have a better response to that, a broader kind of meta recognition that, you know, yeah, this is a smoking withdrawal symptom, it's gonna be over, and they can kind of handle it better and move past it. Um, is there, uh, mainly to Matthew, but to the panel generally, uh, is there any research being done into the effects of LSD or LSD-assisted therapy and obsessive-compulsive disorder? I see that obviously it's going to have a high anxiety um, yeah. component, so you're likely to have bad trips, but um, obviously the more unitive yeah. and, and mystical experiences might help more take the uncertainty out of it. In terms of what's been published, there was, unless I've missed something very recently, there was only one study published with psilocybin. Um, I usually don't cite that as one of the most promising early studies, because if you really look at it at a critical eye, they use several doses, including an extremely trivial dose. 
and they found the, nearly the identical acute effect on reduction of OCD symptoms across all the doses, which really smell strongly of a placebo effect. That said, there are, there are certainly anecdotes out there of people saying they've overcome OCD. I, again, it's in that category. I really think we need to revisit it, and studies should be done on, on well, this. We are currently conducting a study in OCD patients and psilocybin at Yale University. Do you think it might actually be counterproductive because of the anxiety um, and the uncertainty feeding back into bad trips and then just, you know, is it? So we're, we're, we're currently collecting the data. We are not unblinded yet. So I really can't tell you anything about that yet. Um, but we hopefully will be able to publish the results within the next two years. That's great. So we move. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> a question for Olivia. Uh, as far as you know, um, is there any evidence that uh, uh, psychedelic substances allow to have a hallucination of uh, completely novel phenomenal properties? Properties that one cannot uh, uh, find in uh, their own previous uh, experience, like maybe, I don't know, a completely novel hue or uh, something that maybe doesn't belong to any uh, known uh, um, sensor modality, something that looks really alien? Or is it fair to say that uh, uh, most of the experience people have during psychedelic experiences may be described as a recombination of uh, existing and previously experienced properties? So, so I can't say, you know, I haven't spoken to every single person that's ever had an right. experience, but, but I've never heard of anyone report, certainly in these studies that I was doing, a, a truly novel experience. It's very, very common, uh, Katrina made the point, things like motion on top of a static, you know, carpet seems to move. Colours that were not there. Motion is a huge one, but and the synesthesia that you see, you listening to music and seeing motion, and it seems to be matched. So it's, I often talk about it in terms to undergraduate students and things that it's much more like a misattribution of other sensory qualities, or, or for example, the you know the dots people were misattributing self and agency no. to these dots. So. I've never come across anything that's totally foreign. I think people claim that they have truly novel, insightful ideas that they had never had before and could never have without drugs or... Um, but, yeah. Does that answer Thank your question? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is great. Um, I can just tack on to that uh, kind of question. This is for Katrin. Um, if I understood your talk, you're talking about perceptual changes, many of them related to the serotonin receptors. And I have a two-part question. Well, maybe it's three by now. But uh, the second thing you talked about, uh, you used the term integration of sensory information. Is that uh, interchangeable with uh, John and Dunn's uh, concept of filtering? Um, like the filtering processes of the brain? So, um, so I think there, there are two parts. So w the filtering process that I described that is certainly changed in, um, under psychedelics, which, which has been shown with the fMRI data I just showed, but also earlier work is related to um, the thalamus basically not doing, doing its job as it does it during, um, well, normal waking states. Then on top of that, we see that, well, at the point where the information, the sensory information we perceive from the outside or the inside reaches our brain, or not the brain, the, the th cortex, really, um, then we see that under the influence of LSD and psilocybin that our sensory regions are working very, very strongly together, much more strongly um, than under, um, uh, under placebo. And they're highly connected to, um, to the rest of the brain. And, and this is what, I'm meaning with, what I mean with sensory, integration of sensory information. A lot of you know, connection between sensory areas um, that might or might not have something to do with the thalamic filtering. This is something that we, we are very confident that it has. 
um, with an analysis that I didn't show today that there is more information flow from the thalamus also to sensory regions. Okay, what I saw, what I saw was you had two points about, about sensory um, uh, receptors, and one was the increased communication among the sensory areas, but then you also mentioned a reduction of integration of sensory information, and that's what I was asking, is that the same as less filtering? Um, so the, the reduction um, that we saw was in associative regions, um, not in sensory regions. Um, so what, what we see is a decrease in filtering, in a way, yes. yes. Okay. So my second question is, you mentioned several other things besides that, and, and uh, the, the one that you talked about, if I understood it correctly, you said something about the somatic motor network. And you talked about that as um, people having a sense of felt presence. Is that correct? Did I pick that up right? Um, so this is not my research, but uh, and it's not related, not something that we have shown in our LSD work. What we have seen in our LSD work is that um, basically all the symptoms that people were reporting were associated with altered connectivity from the um, sensory motor cortex or the sensory um, motor system with the rest of the brain. Um, however, other studies that were not conducted by me but by other people, um, they have shown that the sensory motor system seems to play a role when people have this feeling of presence. But that doesn't mean that this was also the case um, in our LSD subjects. So okay. can you give me the uh, name of anybody sorry, who did we, such a report? We have about 10 minutes. Um, uh, we can do that offline. Okay. Maybe we can um, stick the questions, like just, just one question per person, so that everybody can go through in the remaining 10 minutes. That side, please. Thank you. Compliments for your careful and serious research. In the practice of insight meditation, vipassana, there is an intended change of perception towards decomposing the mind, decomposing the narrative self in favor of the um, experiential self and this is a big relief because the narrative self has to be defended all the time and you defend it with all kinds of addictions so maybe you can take this as a hypothesis useful for the first speaker's question but now I have a question to Katrin when this is done, when this is done in the meditation context people also experience fear, and part of the meditation is to overcome this fear, and this is done by developing, for example, loving kindness and self-compassion. And my question to you is, how do you prepare the people to have less fear? Um, so that, that's a wonderful question, thank you so much. Um, so there are certain safety guidelines, as Matt pointed out, that obviously we adhere to, but if it comes to individual preparation, first of all, we make sure that they are very comfortable with their environment in general. So um, they, they're happy with the scanning environment especially, but also the environment they will stay in afterwards. And we make sure that they are um, that they are comfortable with the people around them. So um, we introduce everyone um, that they will meet during that day before they decide whether they actually want to do the study or not. Um, and I think this is, this is pretty much key, that they have a good relationship to the people they will meet while they are on the substance and that they are trusting. And um, when it comes to well, difficult experiences, um, we we encourage them to basically, what you just described, to, well, don't stress out too much, let it go, it will go over, we are here, and uh, we ask them if they are okay with us, for example, touching them on the shoulder or holding their hand while they're having a difficult experience. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in philosophical issues about the phenomenology of psychedelic experience. And that interest originates in some moderate acquaintance with LSD experience back when I was in my 20s. And here is one specific um, feature that I find philosophically interesting, and I would like to know what you would say about this. Um, in the early stages of an LSD session or 
and uh, a low a low doses, one can have and as uh, as suppose other subjects say this too, one has, can have this impression of having more direct visual access to the reality, to reality that you are perceiving. And now one could think that's just an illusion, one of those um, created by the drug, but I rather tend to think that there's a core of truth in this, that you have a more direct visual access. And how could that be? And I have two hypotheses that I would like perhaps um, to hear what you say about this. It could have to do with a reduction of what philosophers call cognitive penetration, that the phenomenal character of your visual experience is less under the influence of your background knowledge. So for instance, when you see a tree, you see this unbelievable complex thing there without seeing it as something that is used for certain purposes, without seeing it as something that you know a lot about, and so on and so forth. And the other is that it could have to do with what you have been talking about, like filters. So I would like to, to hear if you have something to say about it. I'm not sure to whom I should address it. I thought perhaps the last speaker. I'm happy to, because I've thought a, a bit about this, I'm not um, up to date with all the relevant philosophy, probably as much as I should, but certainly from the, the sensory experience side is something that I was, that's everything that I was interested in. Um, and I don't have hard evidence for this, but a lot of um, repeated experience through... So one thing that would happen with, these, with the, just the drug session is we'd do the experiments and then people were still high, basically, and it's in a lovely setting in Switzerland and so there's often a forest, okay? So we might go for a walk or just get outside. And time and time and time again, some, and I would be there wandering around thinking about you know, what I was going to do later or whatever it is. It's a long day. And someone on the, on the psychedelics would stop and say, oh, my God, look at that flower. That ye there's a yellow flower there. That is the most amazingly yellow flower I've ever seen. And I would look, and it was a yellow... It was an amazingly bright yellow flower. So it was correct, OK? But I'd walked straight past and hadn't noticed, looking off into the distance and other things. So... That type of thing, I mean, one poor guy said, oh, my God, there's little people in every tree. It's like, what? Oh, yeah, gosh. I looked out the side, there was a little person in every tree. I thought, this is not fair. This is not fair to this poor guy on psychedelics. The Swiss, the, the Swiss being so organised, decided it was like plum harvesting day. <laughs> and they'd given all of the gardeners matching outfits. And there were 20, there was a small person in every tree picking the plums out of the thing. And I'd looked out of the window, and not once had I noticed that there was a person in every tree. And... <laughs> So that's just one, but really that sort of brightness and, and I think so that a lot of that comes from the reduced filtering and I think that that's a really interesting thing and one, it's a, it's a very sort of a metaphorical um, interpretation of the first study that I, I talked about in terms of the, the dots and the, and the motion but I, I do think one way you could maybe conceptualise the sensory experience is not to say that you can't see the forest for the trees, but you can't see the forest for the leaves, okay? The details, but the details are there. You know, you look at a tree, you see the leaves. But if it's actually distracting, you know, depending on the task, it's not necessarily helpful, but it's extremely striking if you're experiencing the leaves in the forest. So that's a hard thing to study, but that's... that's from a sort of boring psychophysical impression. That's what I think is going on. OK. Um, so before I go to my question, I'll just, uh, uh, this is from Dr. Carter, I think. So I, I just want to uh, say that physical system is one in which the entities of the interest can be measured, whether quantitatively as well as qualitatively. So physical system theory is a, um, it doesn't lie, it, it doesn't lie in, uh, in the notion of uh, any analogs but in the concept of the linear graph. And yes, the level of consciousness can be explained by the linear graph theory. So now the question is for everyone, are we invoking consciousness with the psychedelics? Or if out of world experience can be sustained and lead to the highest, highest level of consciousness with drugs, isn't uh, the drug lead to a decrease in consciousness? Or um, we do understand, we are in agreement that if uh, these drugs are taken at a therapeutic dose level, 
it can, we can treat in, as in cancer patients, like we can reduce the pain. But uh, what, what do you uh, think about the addiction? And what do we think about the effect of long-term meditation versus the long-term uses of the psychedelic drugs? Okay, before, before you guys take the question, uh, we'll take the last two questions as well, if they are brief, because we're just running over time now. And then whoever... I can really, so a lot of that I couldn't hear at all. But okay. there was some, again, I think some hint of this is that how should it be compared to meditation and such things and some co conversation about yes, how... Yes, some part of all already has been addressed, addressed like meditation. Yes, yeah. you cannot compare the psychiatric yeah. drugs with the long-term meditation. But, but one, th one thing I think that really one main take-home message from what I was trying to say is not that it's higher or lower or better or worse, is that that's an inappropriate thing to, to do is to simplify the experience into a single dimension. That's really the main thing I'd like to say. So the well, idea that it's just an inappropriate thing, that, that there's more or less or how that maps on to a, a meditation experience, I think is an extremely interesting question, but not trying to say that it's yeah. better or worse. And something I would add, I mean, I think we need to be aware scientifically of what we can actually study and define the constructs that are under study. I wouldn't know how in the world to define someone's level of consciousness as higher or lower. I can study whether they're psychologically functioning healthier or not. So we can use, you know, standard, you know, assessments of that. And so we just have to be data driven. And certainly in our therapeutic studies, we've seen benefit. And we've even seen pov positive psychology benefit in our healthy normals, in our non treatment studies, and, and including people around them in their lives saying they're easier going, they get less stressed out, things like this. And, and in terms of addiction, I showed some data in terms of tobacco addiction. There's also promising modern uh, uh, data um, and, and pilot work showing psilocybin can be helpful for alcoholism. And there's some early data for cocaine uh, addiction. So I, I think there is promise when properly conducted for broadly across addictions. But such studies also have been done in the Unfortunately, we have to move on no, to the next me, question. Excuse me. So maybe minute. you can follow up after no, no, the I'm session. I'm not following up. I'm just saying that... No, but we, we really have to move on to the next question. I apologize for that. Sorry but about the, it. So please, I'm sorry that you, you could not answer the question. Sorry. Okay, so my question is to all three of the lecturers. So you put so much effort into clustering cl the class classification of the effects of psych the psychedelics, but uh, if the thing is just, is just to act activate ser serotonin re re receptors, then uh, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't the tool is too crude, is too rough, so you actually uh, uh, break in a large part of uh, uh, five five HT sig sig signal and brain uh, brain wise right so <laughs> I think uh, it, is it uh, really worth to in, in, investigate it in depth so and uh, why the focus is still on these two chem chemicals L LSD and uh, psilocybin uh, because I think that there are a lot of uh, uh, other uh, agonists of uh, 5-HTA2, maybe with high affinity. So, is it may, may, maybe there is something really sp is, 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 is special <coughs> about L L LSD? <coughs> yeah, I'm happy to say something. One thing people don't automatically think of is that drug, you know, research approval is very difficult with multiple levels, and there is an extraordinarily large a database on human toxicity for both LSD and psilocybin. So if you think, you know, DOM is very compelling as a more selective serotonin 2A agonist, yet you couldn't do human trials with it today. If you have a million dollars or more to fund uh, a number of non-human animal toxicology studies, that's what you would need to get there. So that's a very pragmatic reason why we're sticking with, with that. And also just generally in terms of safety, even though scientifically it's very valuable to work with a more selective, um, uh, you know, uh, ligand, you, um, it does, that does not necessarily mean it is more safe. So we do happen to know that psilocybin and LSD are remarkably physiologically safe. So that's mm -hmm. one additional benefit to working with them. Okay, clear. Um, yeah. We'll move on to the last question, please. Thank Qu you. Quick question. Uh, there seems to be some anecdotal evidence or reports from LSD users that 
weeks or months later, they have flashback experiences. And I was just wondering from the panel, uh, comments on that and what may be going on there, and maybe that has something to do with the addiction that sort of helps them down the road. Maybe there's some rewiring, or what causes these flashbacks? So I probably, it was just for lack of time that I didn't include that in the potential risks category. People report flat, that word can mean many different things. A lot of people in recreational use will say in the days following use, they might see more intense colors or some halos. Um, surprisingly, that seems to be, you know, uh, largely uh, a result of recreational use. There is a phenomenon in psychiatry, uh, hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder that is very rare. It's really mysterious. It may not be exclusively associated with hallucinogen use. And you know, that's sort of like a more salient trigger. Maybe people are more likely to make the attribution about it, but it does seem for a very small number of people that use, is, use of LSD, um, and it is mostly LSD, is associated with psychologically um, uh, troubling, ongoing perceptual problems, given its rarity and the fact that out of thousands of participants in the older and also hundreds in the current research, it has never been observed in clinical research. It's only recreational use that suggests it may be due to co-use of other drugs, including alcohol, um, impure drug, and some type of psychiatric vulnerability that we're somehow weeding out. Thank you. Hey, thank you. So before we close the session, I'll let you know there is going to be a short announcement. Yes. <laughs> thank you much. Speaking about alcohol, um, <laughs> There will be a replication of the experiment of last night, uh, which is called the Hospitality Bar. It, uh, I've heard that it was very successful, maybe so successful that the um, initiators still suffer from their success. <laughs> Johannes, are you here? Oh yeah, they are there. So, same place, same time as yesterday, and have fun. Let's thank all the speakers and see you all in the Hospitality Bar. Thank you.